<laughs> I'm only kidding. You don't have to do that. <laughs> I just want to see what you do. Some of you went, really? Not doing that. Others of you are like your younger ones. You're like, oh, I'll totally tell you how when I was born. The fact that I was born in 1970 makes me part of, I know some of you, some of you just thought, he's so young. Others of you thought, he's really old. And that, just, that just tells you where you are on the scale. Uh, the fact that that's my birth year, sociologists call me part of what they call Generation X, on the older end of Gen X. Perhaps you've heard of that. When I was working in youth ministry many, many years ago, the generation after me, they referred to as Generation Y. Now they refer to them as something different. You know the name? Millennials. Have you heard that phrase, the millennial generation? I, some of you are millennial generation sitting out there. Millennial generation, there's tons of research, uh, a lot of money spent on studying this generation, its impact on our culture and the workforce and all this sort of thing. And now, the generation growing up now, if you're born after the year 2000, 2001 or 2, they're calling you part of Gen Z. Apparently they don't have a, a name yet, so they're using the letters. I don't know what comes after Z. Maybe they go back to A again, but Generation Z. And one of the things they say about these generations, X, Millennials, and Z, and, and increasingly about our culture, is that they're, it's our culture and these generations in particular are defined by uh, two words they call pluralism and relativism. Pluralism. There is a plurality. There are many truth claims in the world today. There's, there's lots of different worldviews claiming to be true. And relativism, meaning they're all relatively true. So put those things together, it goes like this. There's lots of truth claims in the world, and none of them are exclusive. None of them have a corner on the truth. They're all equally valid. That's the prevailing view in our culture, particularly these younger generations. Christian Smith, in uh, his book, Unchristian, he's a Christian sociologist studying our culture, and he wrote uh, that increasingly younger b people growing up in the church or that are leaving the church define their own faith as what he would, they, they wouldn't use this phrase, he used this phrase after interviewing them, uh, thousands of them, therapeutic, moralistic deism. Therapeutic, makes me feel good. Moralistic, be a good person. Deism, God as a general concept, not as a real person. So it makes me feel good, you ought to be good, and there's something out there we call God. So here's the question, though. How do we as Christ followers, if, if you love and serve Jesus, and you want to reflect his glory and his truth in the world, how do we as Christ followers talk about the exclusive claims to the absolute truth of the gospel in a culture that's not even asking that question anymore? They're not even asking if it's true. They're asking, is it relatively true? Does it work for you? Good for you, you find some solace in your beliefs, and that's fine, but it's not true for me necessarily. We live in a culture that's not asking that question. How do we engage people? How do we engage our neighbors? We're at the end of a three-week little mini-series before we launch into the story of God. I'm very excited for you to come back next week as we begin the study of the first book of the story of God, Genesis. But now we're finishing up this series called The Art of Neighboring. Really what it's about is Jesus, when asked what the greatest commandment he, uh, was, he said there's really two sides of one coin. It's the first is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. You can't have love for God unless it produces love for neighbor. And love for neighbor necessarily flows from love for God. Those things are inseparable. That's what it boils down to, Jesus said. So we've been examining, what does that look like? What does it mean? We talked about, you've got to know your neighbor. Start by knowing their name. That would be a good way, right? Know their names, pray for them, care about them, engage with them. Eventually, at some point, you're going to want to share the good news of Jesus Christ that's defined your life. How do you do that in a cu culture where people are saying, hey, don't push that on me, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. How do you talk to people who aren't already churchified? It's not actually a, a word, but I like it. Meaning, they don't have the same categories. You know, a generation ago, even if somebody said, I don't believe in the Bible's true, they at least knew the framework. They knew the basic story, right? When you talked about salvation and sin and repentance and truth, these weren't foreign concepts. You knew you were speaking the same language. Increasingly, you use those phrases, and people are like either don't have any idea what you're talking about, or they think totally different things than you do when you say them. In fact, if you call yourself an evangelical Christian today, is that a good term in our culture? Is that, is that term, if you ever turn on CNN, I'm not saying that you should, but if you ever did, right? Is, is, are evangelical Christians highly thought of today? No, class. No, they're not, right? <laughs> evangelical comes from the word evangel. It's the root of the good news. It means good news people. That's what the word actually means. We're people of the good news. But in our culture, what it increasingly means is, oh, evangelicals. You're those narrow-minded, arrogant, hateful people that are like a Christian version of ISIS. 
That's what people think of evangelicals. We're not saying the same thing anymore. The categories have changed. Interestingly enough, we tend to think of, you know, in the ancient world it was easier. People were more credulous. Not so. In the first century, Paul and the first Christians in the early church were witnessing and sharing the love of Christ in a culture that had no idea the categories they were describing, the story they were explaining, the message they were sharing. So open your Bibles if you have them to Acts chapter 17. If you don't, you can follow along on the screens or listen because I brought my Bible. Acts 17, we're going to read verses 16 through 34. It's a bit of a long story, but it's a great story. Hopefully you'll, it'll be familiar to some of you. Now when Paul was waiting for them at Athens, th- by the way, stop there, them is Silas and Timothy, two of his friends. They were in the north part of Greece, and Paul went to Athens ahead of them. He's just waiting for his buddies. His spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching of Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus saying, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting, for you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing of something new. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance in the past God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. But others said, we'll hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst. But some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysius the Areopagite and a woman named Damaris and others with them. Man, this is such a great story. If you've not read it before, I encourage you to go home and ponder over that this week. Uh, Let's talk a little bit about some background here so you understand the context in which this is happening. Happening. Most of us know that Athens is in the country of Greece. Good, you're doing great so far, right? So in case you didn't, there's a map there. Athens in Greece. Now, if you see straight above Athens, Thessaloniki right there, that's Thessalonica, spelled in Greek. Uh, That's where uh, Silas and Timothy were. Then they went south to Berea. You can read about that in Acts chapter 16. And they got into some trouble there. And so Paul fled, because he was in hot water, to Athens. And he's there just waiting for Silas and Timothy to come from the north to sail down to Athens and meet him. He's not there to plant a church. He's not there to evangelize necessarily. He isn't sent there on a mission. He's just hanging out in town waiting for his buddies to arrive. And that's, I think it's important for us to keep in mind. He's not, what he's there for, but what he ends up doing. Um, Athens was not, at Paul's day, the great military power it once was during the stage of the city-states. If you study your ancient history, you remember Sparta and Athens were rival city-states. Well, those days were over. Rome ruled the world, but Athens was still very much the cultural and intellectual center of the Roman world. It was the place of ideas and philosophies, new information. We'll talk about that a little later. It had spectacular architecture. The Parthenon, have you heard of the Parthenon? Some of you may have been there to see it. Still standing today. By the time Paul shows up in Acts 17, it had already been standing for 500 years. But he's not on a sightseeing tour. 
It's a city of philosophers, artists, and ideas. It's also a city of many, many gods and temples, idols, altars. One ancient historian said you were more likely to meet a god in Athens than a man. And historians estimate there were more than 30,000 idols in ancient Athens, and the population was about twenty to 25,000, so the historian was right. Of course, the greatest deity in Athens would be the goddess Athena, goddess of wisdom. So this is the context in which Paul is hanging out, touring this great historic city, waiting for his friends. He wasn't there to evangelize, but he can't help himself. Notice the text says, as he walked around, in verse 16, excuse me, his spirit was provoked within him. His spirit was provoked. That's the Greek word parowix nato. It literally means pulled in two directions. So Paul's just there waiting for his friends, and he can't help himself. He feels his heart being pulled in two. He feels deeply distressed over what he sees. He was compelled, literally could not keep silent. Not annoyed, not irritated, not judgmental, not angry, but deeply moved over what he saw in this city. So here's a question for you and for me. I've been thinking about this since I preached this last week. What deeply distresses you about our culture? Really, what what moves you in your spirit? What provokes you in our culture today? Politics? Hear a lot about that. The economy? Educational system? Bad drivers? What is it that just, oh, something must be done about this? When's the last time you were deeply distressed, provoked in your spirit over people in our world looking for God in all the wrong places? That's that's the description of Paul's heart. That's what he felt. Now, we're told he goes to two places to deal with this. So he's, he's there. He's got some time to kill. He sees this culture that's looking for something in the, in the wrong places. His heart is deeply moved. So he goes to the synagogue and to the marketplace. Synagogue is the Jewish version of church, not the temple where sacrifices are offered, but local synagogues, local houses of learning in different cities. Paul being raised as a Jew, that's a natural, logical place, right? He goes to the synagogue, and he reasons with those who had the same framework, the same Old Testament understanding, talks to them. Then the second place he goes is the marketplace. The Greek word for the marketplace is agora. I think we'll see here, you'll see the Acropolis in gray. That's where the Parthenon is. You see the agora to above it there? And the Areopagus we'll talk about in just a minute. In fact, go to the next slide, it's better. You'll see a picture of uh, this is today. Paul, down, see the lo- rows of columns down low? That's p- uh, they've excavated part of the ancient Agora marketplace. Now, you hear marketplace, you probably think like farmer's market, maybe shopping mall. That's not really what it was in ancient Greece. You, what you have is sort of, um, it, there was no CNN, there was no Twitter, there was no online news feed. This is the place where you got your news. You went to the center of the city, to the Agora, to hear the latest news from Rome and from the gr- broader world. It's also the place where you went to hear the latest ideas discussed as well as the exchange of goods and services. It literally was the economic, political, um, cultural center of the city, the nerve center of the city. So Paul goes there. That's where he goes to talk about the good news of Jesus Christ. How contemporary is that? What's the center of our culture today? Increasingly, maybe it's online. But he goes to the place where everyone else goes to talk about what matters most. It didn't take long for Paul to attract some attention. He draws a crowd. Paul seemed to do that throughout the book of Acts. If you read his story, he was always drawing attention. And in verse 18, a group of philosophers come and get into it with him, and we're told they were Epicureans and Stoics. Now, you've perhaps heard of Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, morons. Come on, no Princess Bride fans out there? You have to go watch that movie again. Well, those those philosophers had come and gone many centuries before. The two primary schools, Athens was known for its schools of philosophy, uh, basically uh, worldviews and followings that philosophers had in the vein of teachings of the great philosophers. And so in his day, Paul's day, the two great dominant schools were the Epicureans and the Stoics. Epicureans from a man named Epicurus, and then Stoics from a man named Zeno. Both lived about 300, 350 B.C., so they're long gone, but their followers are dominating the philosophical landscape. Are you with me? Who likes philosophy and history? Isn't this exciting? Okay. So Epicurean's view of life was like this. Look, the gods, if they exist, are not very involved in human existence. The way to a meaningful life is to seek your own personal pleasure and fulfillment. 
eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die, sort of approach, right? The way you have a meaningful life, a fulfilled life, is seek your own pleasure. That's the Epicurean view in a nutshell. The Stoic view was, no, the universe is not governed by uh, petulant, um, capricious gods. It's governed by a logical reason behind everything. And so you must accept stoically whatever happens as fated by the rational mind behind it all. Stoicism, stiff upper lip, right? Take whatever comes. Don't get too excited either way. That's the Stoic view. Couldn't be more different, right? But they're both trying to make sense of the world, dominant schools of thought. Both are listening to Paul going, what is he talking about? We want to understand this. They referred to Paul as a babbler. Did you catch that? What's this babbler trying to say? This is funny. In the Greek, uh, the, the word babbler means seed picker. It was a uh, nickname for a little bird that walked along the path and picked its seeds. The implication would be somebody who just picks little bits of information up from other people but has no comprehensive thought of their own. They're saying, what is this guy? What are you, you just picking and choosing what you want to talk about, Paul? We don't understand you at all. That's what they're referring to him as. Paul was preaching the gospel to the intellectual elite, but they had no comprehension of it. How relevant is that today? Do the intellectual elite readily accept the gospel today? Does the good news of Jesus Christ, is that, is that taught in most academies? No, it's, they don't understand it, they scoff at it. Uh, this is an ancient story, but it's incredibly contemporary if we hear it right. So they don't understand him. But they're curious, verses 19 and 21 of the story. In verse 19, they s- basically they, they bring him to the Areopagus, and they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting, in verse 20, for you bring some strange teachings to our ears. And in verse 21, which I think is very funny, for all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing except the telling and the hearing of new ideas. They didn't do anything. They just like to talk about it. Right? Just pontificating. Do you, how, do you like sports talk radio? Who likes sports talk radio? I, I listen to sports talk radio. A couple of men sheepishly, yes, my, I do. Right? I, it's fa- it, what is it? What is sports talk radio? A couple of guys who think they're experts talking about stuff that's happened. But it, does it ever change your life? Do you ever listen to sports talk radio go home and go, I'm a new man because of what I heard on ESPN radio? No. It doesn't do anything, but it's fascinating to me. So we just listen to new stuff, right? Or, or do you, how many listen to the, bl- to the view? Huh? Blah, 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 blah. For like an hour on the view, right? Just whatever. Doesn't change our lives, but we find it interesting. You have something going on like that in, Athe- in, in Athens in this day. People fascinated with new ideas, love to debate and philosophize and pontificate. But it doesn't, they're not doing anything about it. It's not making any real difference in their lives. So they invite Paul then to the Areopagus to give his defense. The Areopagus, was he on trial? Well, kind of. The Areopagus is named for both its, oops, it went away. There it is, up there on the right. Uh, It's on a a hill called Mars Hill. Mars, uh, the god of war. Uh, You perhaps have heard some churches named for Mars Hill. That's where they get the idea from. The Areopagus, Ares, is the Greek name uh, for the same god, god of war. Ares, Areopagus, is named for both the grouping and the place. The Areopagus was about 50 to 55, sort of think city council, uh, they're like the moral, social, and uh, philosoph- philosophical police uh, gatekeepers, guardians of the city. And so some of them had official titles, some of them unofficial, but they would hear cases. Paul's kind of on trial, but not really. They're just interested. Now, he stands up then in this group of, in Athens, the center of philosophical debate in the Greco-Roman world. The place where philosophers go, where ideas are discussed. They bring Paul to Mars Hill, and they say, tell us about this stuff. What an opportunity he has. He stands up, and verses 22 to 34 are his speech. I can read those in about 90 seconds. But the Areopagus tradition was hours of discourse. So what we have in Acts 17 is clearly not the full transcript of Paul's sermon. It's sort of the outline, the high points, if you will. And if you want to read the rest of Paul's letters, you can figure out what he thinks about all of that, what you said. But I think the high points are worth digging into. The first thing he points out to us is this. We all believe something. Every one of us believes something. Verse 22. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. He begins with an observation about their life. Notice what he does not begin with. He does not begin by saying, let me tell you what the Bible says. 
to people who don't accept the Bible as God's word. He doesn't begin by telling them what's wrong with them, does he? He doesn't say, here's all the problems you have that I observed. He makes a somewhat complimentary observation about their behavior and their life and their religion. I noticed something about you. You're very religious. Now, in our culture, if you said somebody's very religious, that's probably not a compliment. But what if you said, I see people of the Tri-Cities, you're pretty spiritual. Right? People like to be called spiritual, not religious these days. Neither one means that much until you understand what you're believing in. But Paul begins there. Observations about them. We live with a certain unprovable, we, we all live with certain unprovable, provable, provable beliefs. That's hard to say. Jonathan Sachs, a Jewish-British philosopher, he writes in his book, The Nature of, of Belief, he says, we all must live our lives on the basis of certain foundational questions. What are we here for? Where do we come from? Where are we going? What's wrong with the world? He says, even, even subconsciously, every one of us is answering these questions, and that forms what we have to call, no, there's no other word for it, belief or faith. Even the atheist who says, I don't believe in God, I only believe what can be proven, right? That's a, I only believe in what? What can be proven? We all have beliefs. However you answer these questions. Think about that for a minute. Atheists, atheists who gather together, I found intriguing. Like, we're going we're gonna to have a club based on something that doesn't exist. Unicorns do not exist. My house, 7 o'clock. Right? It's just weird. It doesn't, but anyway. Atheists who say there is no God. If I was to say to you, I lost my wallet and it is not in my backyard, I would have to have absolute infinite knowledge of my backyard. Every blade of grass, every bark trip, every rock, every leaf, every tree, every board on my deck. I'd have to know everything about it. It's impossible to think about it. I don't have a very big yard, but it's impossible for me to have perfect knowledge. What I'm really saying is, I've looked pretty hard, and I don't think it's back there. So when someone says, I, I, I've observed life and there is no God, that's an incredibly, the hubris of that statement is astounding, really. How can you say that? Who has infinite knowledge of the universe? What we're saying is, based on my observations, I don't think there is one. But we're all basing our lives on certain beliefs. Found answers to foundational questions. How do we get here? What does life mean? Where are we going? But our secular Western society today, we're living in the first society that doesn't believe it has beliefs. Think about that for a minute. People don't, we, people don't, no, we're just rational. We're being rational. We believe in science, it was provable. We don't, ha we don't have beliefs. Vladimir Slovyov, a Russian uh, philosopher says, modern secular people believe that man descended from apes, therefore we must love one another. That sound odd to you? It's a non sequitur. That's his point, right? We're believing you ought to. If I say to you, don't do this, whatever this or that is, and you say, why? And I say, because it's wrong. And you say, why is it wrong? What I should say, if I don't believe there's a God, is I prefer that you don't. I don't like it when you do that. I don't want you to do that. But if I say because it's wrong, I'm appealing to something, right, above myself. Paul's saying, look, I noticed something about you. Very religious. You're looking for something. Okay, back to Paul now. He sees then this altar to an unknown God. This is fascinating. Altar to an unknown God. There were, there were historical uh, documents about uh, there were plagues in the city of Athens, and some, they would go around and make sacrifices to the altars of the known gods, and then wherever uh, they would have these sheep that walked, wherever one f fell dead of the plague, they would erect an altar there to an unknown god. Some, some, some superstitions. And also, later on in Paul's day, they basically, the basic idea was, listen, we know most of the gods, many of the gods, but it's impossible to know all the gods, and so we don't want to unintentionally offend one. Let's build this altar to an unknown god. Paul sees this. Now, in the pagan polytheistic background of the Greeks, you have gods of certain domains, right? You have Poseidon, or Neptune, the god of what? Sea, water, oceans, right? So if you're going to go on a sailing voyage, you would make a sacrifice to Poseidon. You have, you know, uh, you have Artemis, goddess of the hunt. If you're going hunting for your family, you would make a sacrifice to Artemis. You've got Demeter, the goddess of the harvest, and so on and so forth. Uh, and Ares, god of, god of war, and you make these sacrifices. But you, uh, you uh, sought the gods in their domains and in their regions. You also had gods that were regional gods over particular kinds of people. The god of the Ephesians, the god, god uh, you know, um, Artemis of the Ephesians, and Athena of the uh, Athenians, and so on. But you didn't want to give all your allegiance to one god. You didn't want to 
offend one. This is Paul's opportunity. He sees this as evidence of something going on in their hearts. I see you're very religious. I even noticed this temple to an unknown God. And what he's saying is, let me tell you not just who this God is, but let me explain to you what's going on in your own heart. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11, we read that God has set eternity in the hearts of men, but we've not understood what he's done from beginning to end. There is a longing in us for something beyond us. We're reaching out, crying out in the dark. And Paul sees this in this temple to an unknown God. And he says, this is the opportunity. This is my inroad for the gospel. This is incredibly contemporary. We don't have temples and altars like they did in ancient Athens. But we have lots of temples to unknown gods in our culture. Where are the inroads in our culture? Where are the places in our culture, in your life and in mine, where we see clearly this is somebody reaching out for the wrong thing, but driven by the right desire. Paul says, let me tell you about this God. Let me tell you what's going on here. He's not trying to add another God to their already large pantheon. He says, basically, your gods are too small. We all believe in something, and the the truth is, until we come to Christ, our gods are too small. They're too small. They're insufficient for what we long for. This God is utterly different, Paul says in verse 24. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. He doesn't have an address. You can't approach him that way. He's not like your local and regional gods. The God of the Bible does not need you to placate him. He's Lord of heaven and earth, of all that exists. Paul's view of God is so vastly different from the ancient view, and from the contemporary view. One God, creator of all, sovereign over all things, not reducible to a particular location, not able to be manipulated by priests, not restricted to a local place, not dependent on us for anything. Now this is something you need to pay attention to. God is not dependent on you for anything. He does not need you for a thing. And therefore, if, and, and I think if you don't realize this, that you are the dependent one, not God, It's the beginning of idolatry in our hearts. You begin to think you can manipulate God, create God, cajole God, coerce God. Or light, if you call it that. You're the dependent one. If God's not dependent on you, how can you barter with him? What are you going to offer him if he needs nothing from you? But flip that around. That also means everything good in your life, every great thing in your life is yours by grace. Not because you've convinced God to give it to you. Not because you wrestled it away from him. Because he loves you and gives freely. How different Paul's conception of God is, you see, in these simple statements. That's why we know we're not getting the whole sermon. We're getting the, the high points here. The Christian God cannot be bartered with. He doesn't need us, but he gives freely, abundantly. Now Paul's next point is that we exist by his sovereign grace, verses 25 and 26. He made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and boundaries of their dwelling place. What is that saying? God put you where you are. I said this at the beginning two weeks ago we started this series. You didn't choose your, where you live. You think you did. For its school systems and amenities nearby and the kind of community or neighborhood you live in, certainly not for taxes or you wouldn't live in Illinois. But, you know, you didn't choose your home. You think you did, but God is sovereign over your geography. He put you where you are. He determined the boundaries of your lifespan and where you live. And do you ever stop and think about that? I live where I live. I work where I work. I rub shoulders with who I rub shoulders with. Not because I chose it, because God placed me here. Do you think that way? When you walk the halls of your school, when you go to work on Tuesday, do you think God put me here? If you built your own business, God put you there. This is so, what he's saying is so radical. We are all universally connected. And then he tells us why. In verse 27, God established the allotted boundaries for you, the place for you, and then he tells us why he did that. He says, verse 27, that they should seek God. Did you hear that? God placed you where you are in your life 
for one singular reason, that you should seek him. You are who you are, where you are, to seek God. Listen to what he says next. And feel their way toward him. Now, Paul has not quoted a verse of the Bible yet. He's not talked about Jesus yet, but he's getting very close to the gospel, isn't he? You exist to seek God, to feel your way to him, to sense that he's near, and then to find him. And he pauses, and he's not far off. He's closer to you than you realize. So God's not some mystery or puzzle you have to figure out. He's closer than you realize. He's right there. If you would open your eyes and see it. In him we live and move and have our being. This is our, I want to make sure you understand, this is our problem is relational. Paul's talking here about the root of sin. Most of us think about sin as doing bad things. Paul has not once condemned them for their wrong actions, their idolatry, their false worship, their debauchery, the, uh, the pro- temple prostitution, which he would have seen, all the terrible things going on in the city. He doesn't mention that. He doesn't start railing away at all the things that are wrong with them. He is talking about sin. Sin, it, you ever use your computer and get an error message on it? Don't you hate that? I, I, I think technology, but well, never mind. I don't like it, right? And someone may t- come in and try to fix it. They tell you uh, that it's not, the error message isn't the problem. You actually have a virus, which sounds like hocus pocus. Is like, is my computer sick? There's a virus in your computer system. So we tend to think of sin as the error message, doing wrong things. But sin is the virus. Sin is that which causes us to do wrong things and seek wrong gods and, f- and chase after false worship. Paul's saying, at the, at the heart of your problem is not that you've committed bad acts, thought bad thoughts, made bad decisions. The heart of our problem is you have been cut off from him who you were created for. You have a relational problem. If you talk to the average person today and you say, you must repent of your sin, <laughs> they probably think, who are you to tell me what's right and wrong? I mean, you judge over my life. But if you talk about longing, separation, broken relationship, a hunger for something beyond ourselves, love that we can't find, they get that. That's what Paul's doing. He's saying, you're put here, why? To know God. That's what that altar means. That's why you're here. That's what's happening in your heart, but you don't see it. Sin is, sin is fundamentally relational. And then finally, Paul moves and he says, God's solution is Jesus Christ. We all believe in something, but our gods are too small for our own longings. Our fundamental problem is relational. And God's answer is not, uh, here's how you have to live. Here's the six principles. Here's the right sacrifices you have to make. Here's how to approach this God that you haven't known until now. That would make sense to the Greek mind. That would make sense in our culture. What is God's answer to our foundational relational problem? If our problem not, is not doing wrong things, but having the wrong relationship with God, what is God's answer? To make it right. To reconcile us to him. To give us Jesus Christ. That's what the Paul, in fact, most scholars think, when you come down here um, in verse 31, he says, but he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance by raising him from the dead. That's Paul's last word as recorded in Acts 17. And then, they, they, when they heard of that, they basically, some mock him. So most scholars think they interrupted Paul at this point. He didn't get the finish. He didn't get all the way to the cross because they were had enough. Some of them, when they hear about the resurrection of the dead, think ridiculous. Ridiculous. They mock him. Is that contemporary? Some hear about Jesus raising from the dead, dying on a cross. What does that mean? Ridiculous. Why do you believe that ancient stuff? Some say, hmm, interesting. Come back tomorrow. We'll hear more. In other words, I'm intellectually curious, but I'm keeping you at a distance. And some believe. Did you catch that at the end? They named their names Dionysius and Damaris. Why do they name their names? To us, they're just Greek names. But to the people who are reading the book of Acts in the first and second century, they probably know those people. I've been to Athens. He's the Areopagite. Did you catch that? One of the members of that great council believed. Isn't that the way it is today? You talk about the love of Jesus. You get open with your faith. Maybe a family member who thinks you're ridiculous or somebody who doesn't believe the way you believe at work. I talked to a woman. Uh, she just was promoted to a job with Lionsgate Films. She's very excited to be a Christian at a very high level 
with the in our entertainment industry, but she said people that look me up on Facebook, they see me posting scripture verses. They know what I believe, and I can tell they're after me. They wanna, they, they're poking, you know? Some will, when you talk about the love of Christ, some people will go, pfft, ridiculous. Some will go, hmm, interesting. You know? Some will believe. You and I don't get to choose who those people are. I don't get to decide that. You don't get to decide that. The Spirit of God does. All we're called to do is live our lives in this culture for His glory. Look for those temples to unknown gods in your life. Those signs that people are reaching out, longing for something that they can't quite name. It's going on all around us. So I'm going to give you one little challenge as we close and then we'll see the doxology and, and be dismissed. You received this as you came in. At least I hope you did. If not, you can pick one up as you leave. It's a simple little card. It says, The Art of Neighboring. It's got the gold house in the middle, and that's your house. I know you don't all live. Maybe you live in a cul-de-sac or the end of a block, but basically this represents you and the people around you. I, I'm going to encourage you. On the back, it talks about the, some of the things we've talked about. Loving your neighbor means noticing them, that they're there. I talked to a woman last week who came to me and said, When you challenged us to give those bags and talk to our neighbors, I thought, I hate my neighbors. I don't want to do that. But she did. And she told me, she goes, you wouldn't believe it. They were so nice. They let me pray with them. They filled two whole bags and came to the picnic. I thought, who knew? You don't hate them now, do you? So loving your neighbor means noticing them, knowing their name, praying for them, welcoming them, engaging with them and serving them. All this is meant to do is put it on your fridge, put it on your kitchen counter, put it somewhere you'll see it, and just write the names of the people who live around you in those little boxes. And then pray for them. Let it be a tangible reminder to you that you live where you live, not by your choice, but by God's sovereign plan. He put you there to know him and to make him known. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that, uh, that you are a God sovereign over all things, including where we live, our very lives. You created us, you gave us life, and you placed us in this world for one reason, to know you by your son Jesus Christ. And then in knowing you to make you known in the world. Forgive us for chasing after lesser gods. For our, all of our petty concerns that cloud out the love you want to pour into our hearts. For anybody here tonight who doesn't know you. And God, I just pray that you tug on their hearts even now. That you speak words in their hearts that that which they most long for, that which they, their deepest desire can only be found in a relationship with you. And you are not a God who stands far off seeing if we can find you. You give yourself to us. You make yourself known in Jesus. We pray in his name and for his sake and glory. Amen.